It means, it means, I seek refuge of Allah, that first Satan. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All you who believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly and follow not the footstep of Shaitan, for he is new and of all end. If the past life and the near time have come to you, then know that Allah and know that Allah is exalted in our world. Will they wait until Allah comes to them to judge peace of God and angels in his train and crush his spells and but Allah will all precious go back from Jesus? God Almighty speaks to you. Thank you, Brother and And I would like to invite Brother Arif as a Imam represent to say thank you to Brother Arif. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First and foremost, I would like to thank again uh, Imam Center for welcoming me. I was here four years ago. It feels like I was here yesterday, and uh, indeed, it is an honor to meet many of the brothers and sisters that I know here. Uh, it is a very beautiful mosque that I always look forward to when I come to the sea. And indeed, um, for the past four years or so, we have lived under the shade of the pandemic. And there are friends that I knew uh, in New York City, in many parts of America, who are not with us here today, precisely because they have succumbed to this very deadly virus. And if we think that this pandemic is over, uh, let it be known to all of you that this is just the beginning. I'm not actually painting a dark picture of the realities of our times, but the pandemic is a reminder for all of us that there are many challenges that are to come and that humankind will be faced with many, many different problems and issues and sicknesses and all kinds of misfortunes. And if we do not come back to the shade of Allah, to the protection of Allah, we will find it difficult to face with the life that Allah has given us in these very challenging times. So the topic that I'm going to share with everyone here today has to do with the shade of Allah. How then can we be always under the shade of Allah? And indeed, anyone who is under the shade of Allah, in no matter what circumstances that he is put in by Allah, he or she will be able to come out of these problems and gain the best out of this. So we want to ask, how can we come under the shade of Allah? And I want to begin first by saying that we cannot come under the shade of Allah if we do not go back to the two elements that will bring us back to what Islam is, as read just now beautifully by our brothers 
يا ايها الذين امنوا كلوا في السلم كافا ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان انه لكم عدو مبين in order for us to come back to the realities to the actual essence of islam we need to go back to the quran and the sunnah and this is very very important i would just emphasize this wherever i go because there are movements now within islam that says that we can understand islam we can go back to islam without going to the quran and sunnah and this is utterly incorrect in order for us to really feel what islam is to understand the actual meanings of islam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us that he has left us with two things and if we follow this we will never go astray and this is kitabullah wa sunnati the book of allah which is the quran and the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam now in the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam there is this series of books what we call as the hadith and in one of the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulullah tell us about the seven people whom allah has assured will always be under the sheep so i'm going to share about the seven people if you have time um and if you don't i will emphasize on a few and rasulullah says there are seven whom allah will shake with his shade on the day there will be no shade except his the first he says is the just ruler the second a young man who grows up worshiping his lord the third a man whose heart is attached to the mosque the fourth two men or women who love one another for the sake of Allah and meet and part on that basis the fifth a man who is called by a woman of rank a woman of high rank and beauty and he says i fear Allah the sixth a man who gives charity and conceals it to such an extent that his left hand does not know what his right hand gives and last but not least rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us about this person who remembers allah he remembers allah so much when he is alone that his eyes fill up with tears now in contemplating about this very powerful hadith where rasulullah tells us about these people who will be under the shade of allah ibn qayyim al jauziya where a very famous scholar of islam says that if you contemplate about the seven whom allah will shade under his shade in his arsh wherein there is no shade but his you will find that they deserve that shade because of their opposition to their, their desires to their hawa so when we look at the seven people that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is talking about according to ibn qayyim one characteristic that you can see in seven the seven people that is mentioned is that they were in the battle against their hawa they were fighting their desires and indeed if you reflect upon the lives that we are in right now we are constantly in battle against our desires the desire first for who every day muslims are known to be overeating the desire to buy even if you don't have money we buy because we have a credit card the desire for women or men and when we open the internet we have our our phones all of these things are bringing us to desire something that is beyond what allah and the rasul has taught us and hence we need to go back to the tradition we need to go back to the reminders that allah has given us through rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on how we can now come again back to what islam has taught us in order for us to battle against the allures of our desires 
Now the seven people that Rasulullah has mentioned just now, that I mentioned just now in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam emphasized this on the just leader, on the amir that is adil. And this is a big issue if you think about it. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in another hadith, "Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati." All of you are leaders. And all of you are answerable to the people in which you are responsible of. Now, this hadith emphasizes on the importance of the just leader precisely because in the time that we are living in today, there is a problem of leadership at every level of Muslim life. There is a problem of leadership at home. Fathers are not playing their role as the leader of their family. If I talk about where I come from, which is Southeast Asia, especially where many of the people here are from, which is Indonesia and Singapore and Malaysia, the divorce rates amongst Malays is probably the highest amongst the communities in Southeast Asia. We say amongst Malays, bersatu kita tego bercerai kabin lagi. Which means, if I can translate it into English, if we are united or if we come together, we are strong. And if we are separated, we get a divorce. We turn it into an idiom. We turn it into a joke that our families are breaking down. Hence, Rasulullah said, in order for you, for us as Muslims, to get the shape of Allah, we must first be adil. As a leader, be adil as a leader not only to ourselves, be adil as a leader to our family, be adil as a leader to our community if you are managing a boss, and be adil. None of us is actually a leader of the country. Now I want to dwell a little bit about this issue because if you look at the lives of Muslims today, they are the poorest leaders to themselves. And this is the first problem that we have. If you look at the life of an ordinary Muslim in America, in Singapore, in Malaysia, and others, Muslims are the most unhealthiest people on earth. I do not have to cite statistics, but we are the group of people who eat more than we can chew. We eat more than we can chew. There is a culture of Over eating, as we say in Southeast Asia, it's not about makan sikit sikit, which means it's not about eating little by little. Which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teach us, but the culture in Southeast Asia, and you will hear, is sikit sikit makan, which means every time we will eat something. So the leader that Rasulullah is mentioning here. The just leader is not a leader who leads others first, but the just leader is someone who leads himself in order for him to lead others or her. So it has to begin. It has to begin first with ourselves. In order for us to get the shade of Allah, we must first be a leader to ourselves in order for us to be the leader in the family. Now that leads me to the second issue. We have a crisis of men. Kami mempunyai krisis kele kele lakian, as we say in Indonesia or or in Malay language. We have a crisis of men in the global Muslim community, where men are not playing their role in their families. Men are not doing their jobs in their families so much so. There is women who are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in every single family. I always tell my friends in Singapore that sometimes when you think about it, it is better for women to just lead the family themselves because men comes home after work, tired after work, turn on the TV, watch soccer from Maghrib until Isha. After Isha, he wants his food. After he gets his food, he wants to go to sleep. Then the next day. Then the next day. 
But Rasulullah reminds us that a good father is one who does three things to his family. First, he teaches his children the Quran. Second, he gives to his children good names. And that's easy because everybody is Muhammad, everybody is Hassan, everybody is Khadijah nowadays. But last but not least, Rasulullah SAW said that a good father is someone who finds for his children a good mother. And this is the problem that we have in our community when we talk, when we talk about the just leader, that men are not leading women in the family by showing the good example. So the fathers here are going to be a little bit unhappy with you. But in the light of this hadith, if we do not provide the shade for our family, we will not get the shade of Allah. The formula is very simple. If you do not lead your family, you will not get the mercy of Allah. As simple as that. So that is the first, the justice. The second, Rasulullah talks about a young person, be it a woman or a man, who grew up in the worship of Allah. And here, Rasulullah moves from the leader to the follower, to the people on the ground. And he focuses on the Shabbat, the young. Why does he focus on the young? Because Rasulullah has already said that the future of Islam lies in the youth. Now the hadith say that this is a youth who grow up in the worship, in the ibadah of Allah. How can this youth grow up in the worship of Allah if he or she has not seen someone else worshipping Allah? As we all know, young children learn first by seeing, second by listening, and third, by doing. The youth that grew up in the worship of Allah, which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is trying to say here, is the youth that has grown up in a community, in a family, in a condition, in an environment that tells him that the most important thing in your life is Allah. And this is something that I think our children need to get right now. That when we talk to them, we talk to them about Allah. When we inform them of things, we inform them about the realities of why Allah is so important. Because there is another hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when a young man called Ibn Abbas asked Rasulullah uh, was going with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on horseback and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Ibn Abbas, Ya Ghulam, inni wa'alimka kalmat, ihfadillaha yahfazka, ihfadillaha tajidhu tujahaka. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching this young man, maybe 10 to 12 years old, oh young man, let me teach you some words of wisdom, he said to Ibn Abbas. If you want to ask for something, ask Allah. If you want to seek help about something, seek help from Allah. Hence, Ibn Abbas grew up to be the youth that remembers Allah in everything that we do. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we are faced with a society that forgets Allah. And this is the realities of our time. Because of the influences that are out there, our young are being told that God is not important in your life. Everything that you do, you must believe in yourself. Have you heard this before? Believe in yourself. But in Islam, it is not about believing in yourself. The values that we need to teach our children is that you believe in Allah and you believe in the efforts that you have put in for the sake of Allah. So in the second person that Rasulullah is mentioning in his hadith, 
Rasulullah is reminding all of us again, parents, brothers, sisters, friends, to not only become the people who remember Allah, but the people who inform others of why we should go back to Allah. And you can do something simple, like our friend Habib. Anybody here does not know Habib? Everybody knows Habib. Who is Habib? Habib is this great MMA champion and fighter. And now there is Islam. Even better than him, man. What's your name, brother? Islam. But if you look at Habib, what is the one most important thing about Habib? It is not that he has won 29 0. The most important thing about Habib is that in every single fight that he has won and he is put to the mic for an interview, he will say the first thing Alhamdulillah. Every time, all the time. And this is a youth, a Dagestan youth that has grown up in the remembrance of Allah. So that is the second thing. We need to remind our children, even if they choose to forget sometimes, whatever it is, go back to Allah, go back to Allah. If you have to do your exams, mommy, I'm so stressed out in my exams, go and do your prayers, remember Allah. Because if you ask Allah, Allah will give you what you ask for. The third Rasulullah sallallahu says in the hadith is a man whose heart is attached to the mosque. And Rasulullah sallallahu says in another hadith in relation to this hadith, when any one of you performs ablution, wudu, and does it well, then comes to the mosque for no other purpose than prayer, he does not take one step, but Allah will raise him one degree in status, and remove one sin thereby when he enters the mosque. Now the man who's attached to the, his heart to, to mosque is a special person because in everything that he does, the mosque in his, in, is in his mind. And this is something that we need to again build in ourselves and in our young. Because in our lives, we do a lot of wrong things. And if our heart is attached to, our, to the mosque, whatever wrong that we will do, we will go back to the mosque to remind ourselves. But then you ask the next question, how can a man's heart be attached to the mosque? The man's heart or the woman's heart can be attached to the mosque not only through the fact that he sees the importance of the mosque, but the mosque becomes important to him. Hence, this is a challenge for people who are managing mosques. And today I want to send a message to Imam Center and to whoever, whichever mosque there are in America who is listening in. Brothers and sisters, we need to make our mosque more conducive for the young people out there. We need to make our mosque a place where young people feel very, very safe, where young people feel that they own the mosque, where young people feel that if they have any problems, they will go to the mosque and they will find but someone, someone who is whatever, that can help them feel at peace. I was at the mosque just now, giving him a study session, and they have established what they call as the Papua Cafe. Just, Just now, now during my uh, short sharing session, there were a number of young people who came to the mosque to do what? To drink coffee. If you ask them why you go to Kahwa, it's cheaper than Starbucks. Why you go to Kahwa? It's cool. Why you go to Kahwa? Because my friends are here. The young person's heart is attached to Kahwa, not to the mosque. He wants to go to Kohwa, but Kohwa brings him to the mosque. So this is how the da'wah should work. And this is what the hadith is saying, that if you want to bring people whose hearts is attached to the mosque, 
Our mosque must be beautiful. Our mosque must be open. Our mosque must be active. Our mosque must be the mosque that serves anybody and everybody. And this is a challenge for Imam Center as much as it is a challenge for my brothers and sisters uh, in Singapore, in Malaysia and other countries. We need to ensure that the mosque is never empty. We need to make sure that the mosque will always have people coming in because if you have an army of young people in the mosque or a group of young people in the mosque, you have people who will bring the message of the mosque to the larger community. So if this is called al Qahwa, maybe um, in uh, Imam Center, you can call it al Briyani or something. Right? Is better. Maybe you want to have an Indonesian uh, taste meat, you can call Nasi Padang operated. Warung Kopi. And really, I just came back from Bandung to give a lecture there in an international school, Islamic international school. And in Bandung, if you go to Bandung, there's this whole Kopi culture that has developed. Young people are every day, everywhere. Imagine if this Kopi culture is done near to the mosque. During prayers, all these young people will go to the mosque. And we need to do this. We need to transform our mosque so that the young will see that the mosque is the place for them to have social support, to recharge their iman, and the mosque becomes a place where if they have any problems, they can solve their problems in the mosque with the people in the mosque. I'm going to move from the number four to the number five, where Rasulullah SAW talks about a man. But when he means a man, he means it general to everybody who is called by a woman of beauty and position for illegal intercourse, but he says, I fear Allah. This hadith is so telling of our time. Now I'm going to go a little bit of statistics. There is a statistic that is done here in America and in this statistics done by the Journal of Brain, uh, the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy, it is found that 22% of men who is married would always stray from the marriage and get involved with some woman at some point in time. 22% which means every five, five brothers that you see here, one would have done it. Not here, maybe not here, somewhere. <laughs> but the statistics is telling. Right? For every five men, one man has gone astray and tried to be in an affair with another woman. First statistic is that the ladies are already laughing. I know they are doing all these things. The second statistic say 14% of every married woman have gotten into a relationship in an, with another man. You're talking about American society. Eh? So 14% means about one every eight women would have some kind of eight or seven women would have some kind of extra marital relationship with another man. Now, all of these statistics, I can go on and on about uh, statistics on uh, sex before marriage or all, all of these things. Really, if you look at the, the numbers, uh, it is very, very staggering. But Rasulullah is reminding us of that one thing that can affect everything that we do in our lives. And this is what we call as zina. Every Muslim that you talk to will say, I'm not going to do it. It's not going to happen to me. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Minun, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُمْ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ عَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ And those, Allah says in the Quran, who are mu'minun are those who guard their private parts. 
Brothers and sisters in Islam, the reality is that all of us, whether we are religious people or whether we are normal people or whoever, we are susceptible, we are vulnerable, we are prone, in fact, as said in the Quran, to get involved in an extramarital or illegal or illicit sexual relationship. And to be under the shade of Allah, we need to practice what the ulama call as Sotdu Zari'ah. Sotdu Zari'ah is a maxim in Usul Fiqh, which means to block the means of the way that will lead to evil. Wala taqrabu zina inna mungana fahishata wa sa'a sabila. Do not be close to zina, that is Sotdu Zari'ah, because it is an evil and abominable, uh, abominable way. In order to be away from this illegal sexual uh, intercourse, we need to first be away from things that lead us to it. And the things that are leading us to it are what we see on Instagram, on Facebook, on Netflix, on all of these social media channels. One problem that we have in our lives is that every day we are bombarded by pictures of beautiful men and beautiful women, handsome men, I don't think there's handsome women. All of these are entering into our brains every other day. If there's one reminder that I can, I hope that you will remember when I go back to Singapore, is that in the relationship that you have even in religious circles, please be very careful about the boundaries between men and women. I was active in the mosque before. In the mosque, such relationships can happen. So we must be very, very careful and we must always be in guard of the fact that shaitan is always there to make us see something to be very beautiful until we do it and then we lost the shade of Allah. Because if we think about it, anything that we do in regards to sexual intercourse leads us only to despair. It feels good only for 5 to 10 minutes. After that 5 to 10 minutes, there will be regrets, there will be a lot of guilt and pain and it will lead us to, to, a, to a place that will affect everything that we do in our lives. I just want to end with number seven, and then we will open up for uh, question and answers. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that the, the seventh person that is under the shade of Allah is the man who remembers Allah in private, so that he's so much so that his eyes would shed tears. And he specifically said, a man, not a woman. Why? Because it is always not difficult for a woman to cry. You just take a handphone away, she cries. Right? You just take a handbag away, and she cries. The hardest people to cry are men. And Rasulullah emphasized on this. For us to reach the repentance of Allah, we must first submit to the will of Allah. For us to submit to the will of Allah, we need to soften our hearts. And even if we have done a mountain of sins, and just now I was talking about illegal sexual thoughts, Allah is all forgiving and most merciful. And then we must learn as men to cry to to be alone with Allah, to go ila Allah, taubatan nasuha, and then Allah will forgive us. So always remember this for those who are listening in: that whatever sins that you have done, whether it is as high as a mountain or as big as a hill, Allah will forgive you. But Allah will forgive you only when you are able to cry to Him, to be in tears with Him and to ask him for forgiveness.
I want to end by saying that we live again in very, very difficult times, but it is also the best of times. We must be happy that Allah has put us in a time where Muslims all over the world are being challenged. We are challenged by Islamophobia, we are challenged by the pandemic, we are challenged by instability in many Muslim countries, we are challenged by natural disasters, and so forth and so forth. But all of these are actually good for us. All of these musibah that Allah has given us is a way to remind us that we need to go back to Him and to go back to Him to be under the shade of Allah. We need to do these seven things that Allah and His Rasul has reminded us. It is a difficult step for all of us, but the solution to it, as I mentioned just now, is in the Quran and in the Sunnah and I hope that Imam Center will be the place where the Quran and the Sunnah is being, are being studied deeply, reflexively and in a way that is open to everybody. Inshallah, may all of us be guided by Allah and be given the mercy of Allah. Aqul qawli hadha Before he was born, he lost who? 
Isfadu. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam grew up without a father. When he was maybe probably nine years old, he lost his mother. He was an orphan. No father, no mother. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is like is an exemplar for all of us, especially for single mothers, that you can still grow up to be a good person. In fact. In his case, to be a Rasul, even if you do not have parents, and especially if you don't have a father. Imam Bukhari was an orphan, grew up only with his mother. Imam Shafi'i, the great Imam in Southeast Asia, because my name is Southeast Asia, is better than himself, Shafi'i, had no father. If you look at the tabakats of many of the of the ulama of the past. Many of them were raised by single mothers. Of course, some women will tell me, "Ah, that's a good thing. Then my husband should get out of the house." <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Because I want my son to be Imam Shafi'i. You should go, right? That's not. That's not the point. The point is this: in many societies where men, and I'm talking about the society that I'm from, my 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 ancestors are from Yemen, right? Where the men would leave the woman for years and years to go everywhere. In Southeast Asia, we call it merantau, right? Merantau means to, to go on a search everywhere in the world to find money and then go back. Their children grow up well, and the reason is because there is a strong extended family that is there to ensure that even if the kid grows up without the father. There are father figures. There is an African saying that goes like this: that a child is raised by an entire village, right? I think in Africa, I don't know how you say it in the African language that you cannot you cannot raise a child without using the entire village to raise a child. The same thing. Exactly. I must learn how to say it because it sounds very nice. It takes a village. Yeah, the, the saying is actually, it takes a village to raise a child. Why is this saying so powerful? Because a child needs stimulus from many different people, not only fathers. And indeed, in families where fathers are not there, I am not there for my family. I'm always overseas. You need to have a community. That helps the family to grow properly. The problem with societies like the American society is that it's a nafsi nafsi society. That's your life. This is my life. You don't need to feel with my kids. My kids are my rights. Your kids are your right. There's no crossover of rights. And I I think that this needs to be rethink again. We need to revive this whole idea of the village, not that we interfere into somebody's life, but that there must be families helping one another. I am currently teaching in Brunei, and I met some brothers from Africa, namely from Uganda, and they were asking me, "So, brother, where are you from? I'm from Singapore. Oh, that's very nice. But where are you from, really?" I said, "My family is from." From Yemen. Oh, how many wives do you have? <laughs> so why I have six children. Why are you asking me how many wives? I said I have one. There is something wrong with you. <laughs> right? So that is their solution. I'm not saying that that is the solution that I will advocate. But what I'm saying is that in Uganda, they have a model where the community is the family. Of course, their solution to it is marriage, but our solution to this problem, and I've seen statistics in different countries on single parenthood, certainly in America and surely in Southeast Asia, single mothers is now a common reality because marriages now last only for five years. So for those who not married yet, please don't be afraid. Still, you must still get married. But most marriages now, one every three marriages will only survive for five years. 
and one every five marriages after 20 years will also get into a divorce. After you are married for 20 years, I've been married for 23 years. On the 20th year, there is a phenomenon called midlife divorce, where you are with the person for so long, and then the man wake up, wake up in the morning with the person next to me, and then the marriage ends. And this is a big issue in our community, and we need to build a kind of social support such that if this thing happens, if divorce happens, the children are raised by an entire village, an entire community. That is the only solution. There's no other way. But the real solution that we need to have, as I was mentioning just now, is to solve the crisis of men. Kita mempunyai crisis kelelakian, how I can pronounce it. We have a crisis of men in our society where we have absent fathers. That's the first. Absent fathers means the mother is not at home. We have useless fathers. That is worse than absent fathers. Absent fathers is outside, is working. Sometimes he has to do two jobs. In fact, in America, I hear some people, they have three jobs. So they have to work hard to raise the family. They are absent fathers. But these absent fathers, when they come back home in two hours, they are with their children, they will make sure, have you done your Quran? Have you saw that? Have you did this? Have you did that? Home book done? Finish? They go out. Do their work again. Come back. Two hours. All done. The kids grow up. Knowing that the father is not absent. When he's home, he's present. But when you have the second one, useless father, he is at home for 10 hours. 10 hours at home, what does he do? Watching soccer, cricket, rugby, badminton, whatever. Doing nothing. Sleeping. So the first father who works three jobs can achieve more than the second father who does nothing at home. But the one that holds the fort is always the mother. So that's why I always feel that we need to empower our women in order for them to know how to take care of children, even if the father turns out to be useless or the father turns out to be absent for some reason or, or, or some, some reason or another, and always for good reasons why they are absent. Okay, anyone? Uh, this is our friend, uh, probably very 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 Second thing is, we are so grateful to have you back here, uh, especially in this community. Uh, I would like to quit, uh, I mean, there's a, a certain thing that I came to my mind that looking to that happens, interestingly, that certain type of the people who get the shape of is all talk about men. So I just keep in a this woman. Mm. So I don't know, and, uh, maybe is there any space in context that uh, also was on some specific mentioned about the men? Right. Right. Uh, that's the mean that the woman will have less chance to exit or what? Or there is the specific context that and, uh, even though maybe uh, all of the seven, uh, I believe two uh, except for two categories, they are together. Uh, it's just rumor and men who are attached to us that might be specifically the man. Mm -hmm. But the rest will be in the credit for the time for the woman also. But the, the tax for the artist is specifically mentioned about the man. So that's, I think, it's pretty kind of a yeah, but from a little understanding of the Arabic language, and starts is more um, is an expert on this more than myself. My my daughter now is actually doing Arabic language herself in Jordan, and whenever I have questions like this, I will ask her. Whenever some of these hadiths refers to men, actually the reference is a general reference for men and women, right? So that's the first answer for it. But the second answer for it, to me, two of the seven. It is in reference to 
either men or women, the youth whose heart is attached to Allah, and then of course uh, the one on the man who says no to sexual intercourse. So there's a woman there. The second reason I think there is this uh, direct reference to men, as I was mentioning just now, is that in the past Arab society, there is always this belief that all change begins with the man. And that's why whenever Rasulullah addresses people, the reference is first put onto the man. Because Arijal, Awabuna Alan, Isa, that the man is the protectors or the preservers. I don't like words to use the word protectors because the protector means that you are over the woman. In Islam, there's no such thing as man is above woman. There's no such thing because they are from Nafsun Wahida. Hamka, a great scholar of Indonesia, said that if you read the Quran very carefully, it's quite clear that men and women are really equal in Islam. But the method of change by the Rasul, this is called prophetic change. The method of change that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam always emphasized in his society and indeed in our society is to address the men first. That's why Jum'ah, Salatul Jum'ah, is wajib for men, not for women. But women are allowed to come. And in American society, they are even given a special space for it. So my reading of the hadith is that the reference to men is actually a way to initiate change first from that group. Then the change will come from another group, from another gender. But the whole message of the hadith is for everyone. And that's why sometimes, again, all this feminism that is coming up now, Wakanda, Black Panther, Captain America, Wonder Woman, Superwoman. There's this woman empowerment thing which I only agree with, but sometimes it exceeds what is actually necessary. Because in Islam, to empower women doesn't mean to discount the role of men. That's the first. Secondly, to talk about men doesn't mean that you neglect women. Because it is clear, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Ali Imran, man, right? Then after that, Surah An Nisa. Is that Surah Al Rijal? No, it's not Surah Al Rijal in the Quran. What's the problem here? They're not addressing men. Now men get very unhappy. So if you look at how the Quran arranges the priority of of people of things. It is quite clear that women is always on top, right? And indeed, in some Asian societies, as I was mentioning in Adams just now, women are always in power, and this is a reality of our some Asian life. I don't know how it is like in Africa. Certainly, in this hadith, it is how Rasulullah wants to change, change the man, you change the woman. Okay, and just not the brother. Um, you have provided a list of seven people who end up in the machine of us on that question. I think some scholars were added two others types. One of them would be people who memorize four or five hours of their life. The second of them actually covered this ethics. He said, let it go ahead and go on. What else would this have all this in them? He did not buy a whole lot of money. Aiden had pulled up. It means that the verily Allah is saying in the day of resurrection, where are those who want each other for the sake of my boy? Today I will shelter them in my shade for the day when there is no shade but mine. Totally. So the second one that you mentioned is actually the sixth or the fifth person that is mentioned in the hadith as well. Two men, I didn't mention that. Two men who come and meet one another and they part only for the sake of Allah. Now, this hadith sometimes have been misunderstood. They say the men love one another. That's not the actually actual purpose of, of the hadith. The emphasis here, and good that you bring it up, is that whenever we meet our brothers, 
we must meet them out of sheer love for them. And Rasulullah emphasizes this because amongst men, there is this tendency to outdo one another. Right? And this is a tendency of us men. When you see someone who is better than us, there is this complex that we have, either it's superiority complex or inferiority complex, but there is this competition and this is in the nature of men. Rasulullah reminds us that you meet because you want to learn from another, from one another, and one point because you love one another. And if you love one, one another, you would always want things that is good for your brother. And this is very, very important amongst uh, all of us. We say, there is another hadith that Rasulullah says that if you dua, you make dua for your brother, the angels will make dua for you. So my friend will say, Harudin, I dua that you will marry a beautiful wife. I said, I'm already married. No, because I want the angels to dua for me. So, you know, this is meant. Yeah. They always tell the hadith in the hadith. I try. Any, any more? Yeah. Um, when you just mentioned about the seven, I believe, and it reflects to myself, I believe everybody uh, one by one will check, check one, check two, or check three. So the question here, uh, does all of this apply until, you know, until we die? Or let's say uh, number one, check, number two, we miss. Okay. So that we, does not fall into this category or we could just you know uh, how to regain again that we could fall into this category we um, already make or miss that the maxim that we have among the Arabs is an insan that human beings are a place of uh, errors and forgetfulness we will surely forget of the things that we are supposed to do there is a scholar whose name is al Hasibi. He writes in his book that the one who forgets, who knows he forgets, and he repents or she repents, that person is more noble in the eyes of Allah than one who does not know that he forgets. So the fact that you are conscious, that you forget the checklist, only goes to show that you are always conscious of Allah. And that is most important. But we will always forget. And that's why the hadith emphasizes on people who remind us of our forgetfulness. So this is the second point. One issue that we have again amongst men and also women is that we do not accept reminders. We do not accept reminders. The more cleverer we are, the more we know, the less we listen. Even for myself. That's why I make it a habit, it is my personal habit, to ask my wife to remind me of something. I always ask her, please, please criticize me. Is there anything that you think I have done wrong? Say it. Of course, you must, uh, you must like bite your teeth a little bit. Right? Yeah, of course, I know. She, my wife is a more the quiet kind. But once I open up the door, <laughs> right? This oh, really? Oh, you sure? Yeah, please carry on. That's it. It's a whole book of things. <laughs> Always remember that women have long memories. Men always forget. He does something wrong, he puts the towel on the bed, he forgets. Correct? He leaves the socks on the table, he forgets. The woman. Remember on 7th February 1992. <laughs> so, on the 7th February, you were not there when I gave birth to the fourth child. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it comes and it comes and it comes. But for the men, again, go back to the brother's question, we must take this because one who is able to listen learns. Remember this. One who is able to listen, learns. Kul ar'aitum in sha'akum wa ja'ala lakum sam'a wal absara wal afidah. Qalilama tashkurun. Surah Al-Mulun. 
Allah reminds us, remember of these people who is given the ability to hear, the ability to be said, the ability to, to take heat from the heart, right? But they have little uh, thankfulness to Allah. So listen, brothers, listen. Listen to your wife. Listen to criticisms. Listen to advice. Listen to reminders. And the more you are in positions of power, of knowledge, of control, of influence, the more you must listen. And the failure of men, the failure of human beings, is always because they fail to listen. That's all. There's no other reason why people fail. That's why Rasulullah is known to be someone who is a good listener. And not only that, if I can add a little bit to your question, he is also a good questioner. Someone who likes to ask questions. So what did he ask? He asked Sayyidina Aisha. He said to Sayyidina Aisha, uh, no, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Aisha asked him, in fact, and he was listening, right? Sayyidina Aisha asked him, Oh Rasulullah, how is your love for me? Sayyidina Aisha asked him. Now, if your wife asks you, Oh, suffering. <laughs> His wife's not here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm asking him. <laughs> how is your love for me? Your wife is asking you a question. That's it. Ego will come up with you. So what do you answer? You answer with a question. Why are you asking this question? And what did Rasulullah says when he was asked? This is Sahih Hadith. How beautiful a man who listens, who questions, answer the question from his wife. He says, like a rope's knot. You know a rope? When you tie a knot, Ulwatul Muthqa, right? So tight. One year later, one year later, Aisha thought that Rasulullah will forget the question. Will forget the question. So she asked Rasulullah, Oh Rasulullah, how is the knot? Imagine your wife asked you the question the year before. How is your love for me? You say, like a rope's knot. Your wife asked you a year later, during Hari Raya, during Idul Fitri, How's the knot? And you're asking your wife, which knot are you talking about? <laughs> what knot is this? You know what Rasulullah says? And by then, Rasulullah is getting maybe eight years. And he still remembers. He said to Aisha, as tight as ever. See how beautiful. And this is what we men should be. We men should listen more. Listen more. Let them question us. Question us, question us, and we answer them because in answers there is love. Okay, any more? Dr. Rodin, you touched on many very, very fundamental yet so much needed refreshment. For example, the need of a community to supplement the life. Then also, and then therefore, we are here sitting in this masjid today. One of the reasons is because of that. And number two is in today's world, after 20 years, really, Islam is bad, Muslim is bad, you are bad, media, television, uh, book, you name it. Alhamdulillah, today we are almost come out from that area. But the community is sometimes still thinking like we are facing the same uh, playground. Uh, you mentioned about the Kapula successful story at Adams. When ICE is bringing people, marching on those people to the And um, in today's world, men also, you know, the young, the youth, they work, they have to travel. To make a living, to meet the enemies that you mentioned, fathers, 
two jobs, three jobs. But sometimes we, the community also try so hard to, to facilitate that. <coughs> but the biggest challenge also in today's world is that because the problem in the other side of the world is also a problem here. So we have TV news and WhatsApp and internet. And how do we balance that? Still under the shade of a lot of questions. How do we balance this? Because our complexity of life today is really, really complex to the highest we can understand it or human, humanly understand it. But we as a community, for example, here in Silver Spring, Maryland, Sometimes we think about global issue, and we don't even know how to fit it into our problem here. And I think that's part of the crux of the problem that we are facing today. Alhamdulillah, we did a lot of things to be thankful about, but I think use the subject you bring in today under the shade of Allah is here to bring a profound reminder that we need to re-evaluate and reassert ourselves and optimize, maximize our efforts in where our serving area was still care about the other area. So well I, I always feel you see the Quran in two ayats of the Quran, the sign mentions Surah Al Mubinun, uh, Allah says that one of the characteristics of the Mubinun is the one who ensures that he fulfills or who, who does his uh, responsibilities. But in another ayat, if I'm not wrong, is in Surah al talaq Is in Surah, surah al talaq where Allah says, Fattakullaha mastata'atum Wasma'u Again, listen. Fattakullaha mastata'atum Wasma'u wa'atayu li'anfusikum Wa ma yufashuha nafsihi fa'ulaika humul muflihun have fear of Allah, have consciousness of Allah in the ways in which you are able to, to your level of capacity. So this is the, this ayat, this ayat provide some guidance for us in doing work for the community. The first is, don't do what you cannot do. That's the first thing that you must remember. And it's the first thing that we remind ourselves as people who are in search of knowledge. I see myself as a student of knowledge. Orang Melayu kata, kalau kail panjang sejengkal, lautan dalam jangan diduga. Let me translate it to English. The Malays believe that if your fishing rod, right, and your fishing line is not deep enough, don't go to the open sea. Which is a good principle, which is basically telling us if you cannot do so much, don't do too much. So this is the first thing that Imam said to us. With the resources that you have, how can you maximize it to do what you can? That's the first, right? The second question you need to ask in relation to the Hadith and the Quran and, and other sources of Islam is, who are you responsible for? Right? Who are you responsible for? Are you responsible for your family only? It's a question, eh? I'm not giving the answer. Are you responsible only for Indonesians? Are you responsible for the Muslim community in Maryland? Are you responsible for the whole of America? No, you cannot help the whole of America. Can you help the whole of the state of Maryland? Maybe. Can you help? Not only the whole state of Maryland, but at least the Muslims in Maryland, uh, maybe that's achievable. Should you only help the Indonesians? That cannot be the case. Correct, right? If this mosque is only for Indonesians, then it's not a successful mosque. The way I see it, why is it not a successful mosque if it's only for Indonesians? Because that the purpose of the mosque is for you to bring people in worship of Allah. In worship of Allah cannot be only your own people, it has to be for everybody. So we need to ask ourselves these very crucial questions. Once you have identified what we say in Fibu Dawah, your mad'un, 
the people that you want to reach out to and you need to scope it very, very clearly. Who are our clientele if you want to use business language to know your ROI, not trying to be a businessman, your return of investment, to know your return of investment, you must first know what are you investing in, correct or not? You don't buy any share and then you don't make any money from it. You must know what you want to invest on. So you want to invest on certain groups that you know that you can maximize your profit. Who are these groups that you should invest on? I can only talk about Adam Center because that is the nearest model. Adam Center, they are investing most of their resources from what I can see on young people. Because when I come to Adam Center just now, there are young kids playing in the gymnasium. There are youth eating at the kohwa. And there's no old people around. I was thinking to myself, where are all these uncles and aunties? They're not there. When I came at 3 o'clock. Uh, sorry, uh, I came at 1 o'clock after Zohar. No uncles and aunties there, very few. Old, I'm sorry, old uncles and aunties. But there are these young people. You know, this was Adam Center, youth is their clientele. What is their return of investment? Recording and progress. Their return of investment is youth getting get more involved in, in more activities. So now, the, the leadership of Imam Center, I will encourage all of you sit down, have a discussion, and now decide who do you want to give your resources on? Is it you want to build, uh, you want to try and attract professionals into the malls so that these professionals can help to grow the resources? That is one group. And when I was staying in New York, the malls in New York, one of the malls in New York, their focus, I can see, are workers working in New York. So in every prayer, you will see a lot of these brothers. I don't even know about Sinhala. Now I learned that many of these Sinhalis are from Wolof. Wolof, from Wolof, right? Because the most ROI is that many of these workers can come, we prepare food for them, and become the most. So we must have this conscious effort to identify. That, uh, without them, we can solve this issue about this issue. Right. I'll give you another beautiful ayat of the Quran that, that I always think about because I have children. I mean, like I said to you before, I have six children ranging from the age of 22 to 8 years old. So I have a range. The ones who have become my friends because she's studying in Jordan now, she's teaching me. I'm not teaching her anymore. She will say, you know, my interpretation is wrong. Actually, the ayat is like this. Okay, thank you very much, Ustazah. There is an ayat in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَعْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ 
Waliyalamallahu ma yang suruhu warusulahu bil ghaib Inna Allah kawiyun aziz. So that the first one Allah talks about the importance. Now the second ayat go to surah al hadid you can open surah al hadid the surah number 57 the last page of the surah the second ayat is beautiful because after talking about the prophets allah then talks about the challenges that the prophets face walaqad arsalna walaqad arsalna nuha wa ibrahima Wajalna bi zuriyatih zuriyatih huma zuriyatih zuriyatih man kubum nubu atau wal kitab famin hum muhtadin wa kathirum min hum fasikun. Allah talks about the sons of Nuh and Ibrahim, two big prophets. Nuh is a great prophet. Who preaches for 900 years, and then he had to flee because of the flood. Ibrahim, who was in so much difficulty from his father, from his kaum, and everything, and Allah says in the ayat that amongst their children, famin hum muhtadin wa kathirum min hum fasikun. The prophets who are given the, the nubuwa, right? They will have children. Some of them will be guided, but many of them will be led astray. It is a reminder for us that no matter what we do for our children, who is the one that gives them hidayah? It's not us. We have no control. But we can only do our best. In the end, Allah will question us for what we have done for our children. But ultimately, our children decides what they want for themselves. So I am also reminding myself right now, as I as I'm sharing this with you, whatever we do for our children, as the brother is sharing just now. We cannot have a cause and effect uh, kind of mentality, sabab musabab mentality, which means since I have taught my children Islam, since she or he or she is small, he or she will grow up a good Muslim. It doesn't function like that. And indeed, in the story of the prophets in Surah Al Hadid, it doesn't function like that. The more important thing, which we are always reminded every Friday, is that in Surah Al Ghashia, Allah says that you are only a reminder. Allah reminds Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are only a plain reminder. And at the end of the day, whether somebody goes astray or somebody goes to the right way. It is Allah who decides, but more importantly, it is the person who decides. Wa ma kunna muadibina hatta nabaatha rasula. The ayat before that, manik tada fa inna ma yahtadi di nasi, wa man dalla fa inna ma yadilu alaiha, wa la taziru waziratun wizra ukhra, wa ma kunna muadibina hatta nabaatha rasula. Whoever goes right, they go right for themselves. Whoever goes wrong, they go wrong for themselves, and no one is responsible for another person's bad deeds or sins. And Allah will not put an azab; Allah will not punish someone, save that Allah will send a reminder to that person. So even for our children, if any of our children goes astray, we must understand that Allah has promised He will send someone to remind them, and if they do not accept the reminder, they will have to face. The azab of Allah, but before that happens, we do our job. What happens to them, we have to leave it to what they are. Pamin hum muqtadin, wa kathirum min hum fasikun. Sad as it is, but that is the reality of life. Not all apples that you plant in a plantation 
will be at the apples that you can eat. But that doesn't mean that you should stop growing apples. Right? Is that the lady? Is that okay? Yeah, no ladies too. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, uh, thank you for for in your lecture. Um, and you know, you mentioned about the people who are shaded, the seven type of people who are shaded. Uh, does that mean like if, like for example, one person belongs, you belong to one type of people, you will be shaded. But how about like, for example, if um, like, let's say a person worship the Lord and, you know, does two, two characters or like two things here, but then this person is really completely um, like, do not like to give to charity or if that person give to charity, they would brag. So really like complete opposite. So does that mean it negates the other like characteristic or that person is still being shaded because of like just at least one character? Right, very good question. Well, I think the hadith is saying that we should manifest all of the traits that are there. Uh, the traits are actually very general. Be someone who do not commit major sins like illegal or illicit sexual relationships. Be someone who is charitable because through charity, you wipe out your sins. There is no way to me that one can be a good mu'min because go back to Surah Mu'minun again. Very interesting Surah Mu'minun because it fits into this hadith. Surah Mu'minun, Qad aflahal mu'minun. Alladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. He is the one who is humble in the state of prayer. Walladhina hum anillawi mu'aridun. The one who doesn't talk vain talk, who remove from talking about unnecessary things. And he is the one who gives zakat. And the same is it, that ayat and this hadith. That one cannot be a good mu'min, one cannot be under the shade of Allah, if one does one thing right and one thing wrong at the same time, thinking that it will all balance off. Do not mix the batil and the truth. So, in the light of this hadith, Rasulullah is telling us, try to manifest as many of these traits. Because having all of it ensures that one is in the shade of Allah. I forgot to mention just now that the analogy of the shade of Allah means that one is always within the ambit of the sharia. Because the hadith is also talking about the sharia. One is always following the rules of Allah. And especially charity is the ways in which Rasulullah and our religion teaches us that whatever that we have, always give it to others. Because that takes away from us the sins that we have committed. Because charity is the best way by which one can clean off their sins. And that's why I like uh, the lecture by Omar Sulaiman if I can repeat it here, it's a very beautiful lecture where he talks about sinning. When we do sins, how do we get rid of sins? Rasulullah says, when you do sins, whenever you do something bad, replace it with something good. And Omar Sulaiman said, whenever you see something bad on the internet, give $5 to the mosque. It will wipe out your sins. And you keep on doing it until you tell yourself, I don't want to go bankrupt. So charity is a beautiful thing. And indeed, if you are in any condition, any state where you feel stressed, where you feel that your problems are just so many, my small advice to everyone here, and I've done it for myself, give some charity. And the problems slowly will go away. And this is how Islam teaches us. The more we give to people, 
the more Allah will give to us because we show how we are so thankful to Allah. La in shakartum la azidan nakum. If you are thankful to Allah, Allah will increase whatever that He has given to you due to your thankfulness. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters, for welcoming me here. I think it's one more. And oh, one more. Okay. We, we will close after after brother suffering. That's very nice. Question. Okay. Oh, the suffering. No, sorry, sorry. And no, no, no. <laughs> and after that, we will uh, close with the dua. We will stop here, inshallah. Padon, padon. Yeah, Doctor Heroine, as always, always inspiring. Uh, I would like to link it the two groups of people: number two and number three. Number two is a youth who grow up uh, worshiping Allah. We still remember the parents here. We bring our kids to Sunday school, to madrasa. Now they grow up. And then the number three, uh, a man who is hard attached with the mosque. What are we missing here tonight? What, what are, who are we missing? Or what are we missing? Young people. Young people. So it is a strong reminder for all of us, the parents, like, like or uh, the, uh, the imam in, in SFS, as an organization, I think uh, it is. Uh, we need. We need to make sure. That's why it is being recorded. This is good because your message is very strong, and in Korea is a strong reminder. Uh, but since you have six children, and then their spreads, you know, some sorry going into young adults. Uh, maybe you can share more uh, as your last points on how we bring more the 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 youths you know to the mosque or getting active because we all here you know all the kids you know we brought into sunday school and then they grow up you know uh, learning and uh, understanding islam but they grow up they have their own career they have their job they're busy with their lives but i think there's some missing link that we need to uh, learn here tonight i can just give you three words that my kids like to use and they will go to the mosque if these keywords are there. The first one is cool. Cool. It's cool, man. So you must make the place cool for them. Cool means there's coffee. That's cool. That's the first thing that they want to, to see. Yeah? Sports. These things are cool. But sports is the second word. Fun. So if you talk to your kids, this is the second keyword they will always say. Why are you playing online games all the time? Fun. Right? Everyone here surely have kids, including mine, who's into gaming. And the boys will always go CSGO, whatever game, this shooting, shooting game drives me crazy, actually. So cool, fun. And the last one that they like to say is nice. Nice. The thing is nice. What is nice? The environment is nice, one. And food. Because young kids now, what do they like? Cupcakes. Correct? Do you like cupcakes? No, candy. They like cupcakes. They like ice cream. And they like pizza. And they like this tea. This tea with this, I don't know why it's got this bubble thing. Right? It's like it gives you the sugar spike. So these are the things that they like. If you ask these two handsome boys here, that's all they want. They want fun. They want cool. They want nice. If you have the fun, the cool, the nice, and together with it, you have the Quran, then the Quran becomes fun, cool, and nice. So we need to make our mosque like that. And we need to bring people who give talks to them in a fun, cool, and nice way. So I'm going to ask them later on, when I get to you, the two boys, is my talk fun, cool, and nice? All right. So that's the way, right? So that's the only way we can reach out to them. If not, if we are always talking to them in a manner that they feel that it is so difficult for us to relate, then we are going to lose them. And if our mosque look like, you know, a place where they come and they feel scared, you know, I cannot talk, I cannot make noise a little bit, then they will not come to the mosque. I would really encourage every one of you here today to go to Kohwa 
and see how cool, fun, and nice the place is. And we copy from them shamelessly and make it bigger here. Okay? Inshallah. Ustad, can you lead the dua, please? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Profesor Khairuddin. Uh, Alhamdulillah. We got enlargement. Alhamdulillah. Uh, okay. InsyaAllah we make dua. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Hamdan na'amin. Hamdan syakirin. Hamdan yuafi na'amah wa yukafi mazidah. Ya Rabbana lakal hamdu kama ya maghir jalali wa jika on sultanik. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad fil awalin Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad fil akhirin Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad fil malil an la ila yamiddin Allahumma fil lana wa li walidina warhamhuma kama rabbana sighara wal jamil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat innaka mujibud da'awat ya qadir hajat Allahumma anta rabban nas anhibil ba's anta shafi yashfi mardona yashfi mardal muslimin Anta syafi la shifaan illa shifa'uka Shifa'an la yugadiru saqama Bi rahmatika rahman rahimin Allahumma ja'an jamana hadha jaman marhuma Wa tafarruqana min ba'lihi Tafarruqa ma'asuma Wa la taj'an min baynina Wa la min hawlna syakiyya Wa la mahruma Allahumma la taj'ana hadha Maqam damban illa ghafartah Wa la aiban illa sadartah Wa la maridhan illa syafaitah Wa la maitan illa rahimtah Wa la waladan illa rabbaitah ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا إلا قضيتها وسرتها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أصلح أمورنا اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة في الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد ولا آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفر الله وأتوب إليك دكتور ممكن أن تقوم بالتصوير معنا ونستطيع أن نعمل مع بعض لكي نعمل مع بعض